Hello everybody, welcome to this next episode of K9's Talking Sense. Episode 87, the one that we're calling Trainer's Jam Session, which what Michael refers to is just like musicians, when they sit down together, have their instruments, kind of an impromptu session turns into some great music. So this episode, we just sit down, myself, Forrest Mickey, Michael Ellis, and Natalie Morris, and we just have a jam session. We talk about things from just general dog training, working with people, odor, plenty of detection things. But it's a session where we explore different experiences we've had, different kind of things we've gone through, different things we even question if we still believe. I really hope you guys like this episode. I loved doing this episode. Uh, one of my most favorites in a long time. I really want your guys' feedback, so tell us in the comments. Give us a like on YouTube, on Spotify, Apple uh, Podcasts, anywhere of those places that you guys watch or listen to this podcast. Give us some feedback. It really helps the, the channel. It helps with growing the channel. Um, we've had tremendous growth. I'm super thankful for all you guys. You guys are awesome. I really enjoy uh, being able to share a lot of these guests, a lot of the information with all of you guys. A quick update for Ford K9. A lot of you guys have been asking for when are we doing some of these online classes. They're now active. We have the CSDT, the Sport Dog Trainer class. That's now available online. Our intern detection dog trainer class also online now. These programs are the same programs that we do in person just for remote learning. There's a few new webinars up for our members. There's also, actually for everybody, but our members get them for free. We also have um, a new video I did called Bulletproof Your Detection. That's available online now too. There's lots more coming. So I can't thank all of you enough who are members of Ford K9. There's lots of new content coming. There's new content there. So I hope you guys really enjoy it. But as well, send us your questions. We do monthly Q and A's now. Those are also now on video. If you're not a member, you can just purchase the Q and A by itself. If you're a member, you get the Q and A for free. So I, again, if you're a member, I can't thank you enough. If you're not a member, come join it. There's a lot of cool stuff that we have going on. So let's get on to the episode. Again, I can't wait to hear from you guys. I can't thank you guys enough. Let's get into it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of K9's Talking Sense. As usual, I'm your host, Cameron Ford, and this time I'm sitting here in the cafe lounge of the Michael Ellis School for Dog Trainers. And because we have such fun here in trainer land, we got more trainers with us. This time, not only do we have Natalie co-hosting with me, but we're here, we have Michael again, and we have Forrest here. Thank you guys for being here for this podcast episode. My L pleasure. L love being here. Yeah, <laughs> so, I wanted to, this episode, you know, obviously K9's Talking Sense is usually about detection, but I figured why don't we just talk about dog tr training in general, dog stuff, keep it loose, free, and let us, you know, collectively with our, you know, talk about things that strike us or have a interest to us or things like that. So... Proud of you, proud of you, Cameron. <laughs> Stre Michael, stretching my boundaries. Story yeah, I'm waiting to hear the rest of the bird I story. I want to hear about the bird dropping <laughs> seeds from whatever the elevation is. You know? Yeah. But it, it, it was funny. Well, speaking of that then, we'll, we'll start with that a little bit. I was sharing a, uh, there's a series on Netflix called Explained, and this one was The Mind Explained. Is and it Chris, started. Chris Hemsworth? Uh, no, that's a different, that geo, that's a different kind of show, but that's about the, the body. Uh, and the mind too, actually, it does, it does both. This one was explained was the specific categories of the mind, like memory, traumatic events, cool. things like that. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I pulled it up was because you had mentioned, Michael, the other day, uh, Dr. Sapolsky uh -huh. and the dopamine aspect. Uh, 
So I happen to see him on one of those Netflix episodes, and he's true Sapolsky. He's like in a ripped T-shirt with a coffee stain on yeah, the front of it. He's doesn't awesome. care he's that totally he's on awesome. Netflix, you know, <laughs> his, his, his total Sapolsky self. But it was about memory, and what was really cool was they were sharing different things about memory, um, and there was a, a bird that they shared, a Clark's Nutcracker, yep. and how amazing the memory of that was. They would throw out stash, like you said, 30,000 seeds. Cash, actually. Cash, sorry, yeah. cash, cash, <laughs> 30,000 yeah. seeds yeah. with <laughs> retrieving 6,000 of them months and months later, next season oh, yeah. later. Yeah. And that was an incredible thing that, you know, humans can't even do something like that. So yeah. that's kind of how. It's so like recall 18% of those seeds or something like yeah. that. Right? And yeah. And they're period, hidden yeah. in the environment in crazy places. Like yeah. they bury them under trolls. They well, stick like them really in the really I wish my yeah. woodpeckers yeah. around my house at the new <laughs> building we're building could retrieve their damn acorns. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it's just yeah. everywhere. Yep. You know? yep. <laughs> but the, the amazing thing is that the, I got kind of into bird brain stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Because we, we have this model that... Um, larger brains mm -hmm. are more robust and they're able mm -hmm. to do more things. Yeah. And it's actually the cl uh, how close the neurons are packed in together. Mm. And bird brains, which everybody says are really small, mm. are, have neurons packed super tightly. Are dense, so to it's speak. It's crazy yeah. dense. Mm -hmm. And they're capable of things that are way beyond our kind of memory, mm. uh, visual memory mm. and spatial memory. Mm. They Like they'll have, uh, the I was watched a thing on um, ant birds. So there's these birds that are in the tropics called ant birds, and they actually hunt in front of these big um, colonies of, um, they're like army ants that go okay. out and they go through the forest in big droves and they drive everything in front of them. They'll climb up trees, they eat anything they come across. The ants do? The ants do, okay. right? Yeah. And so in fr at the front of the ant swarm that's cruising through at various times when they go on these hu hunting parties, basically, mm. birds have learned to follow along because there's all kinds of stuff trying wow. to get away and they just eat the stuff that's trying <laughs> to get away from the yeah. ants. Yeah. Well, this one bird's like studied the um, ants so much that it knows where all their colonies are and where, because the ants will ball up in this colony and hide out and then go out at r random times to go search for food. And they've become kind of experts on them. And they keep it track in their mind of where they all are through the forest. And they visit them at the right time. They have they know the time of day the that they're most likely to go. they're going to move and go do yeah. their thing. And yeah. other birds now follow them. Oh, that bird. Because that, that bird has adapted mm. so much to that. And they, they know ant behavior so well that all these other birds use them as sig wow. signals. There's tons of crazy That's stuff. It's a harmonious like that. ecosystem. Yeah, it's right? Amazing. Yeah. yeah, it just reminds us to not get hung up on our brain, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, like ours is the pinnacle of all yeah, evolution. Yeah. Or that was right? the biggest thing they were sharing was, you know, uh, that point you were making, like the human brain has like 160 million neurons in it. And that was the measure for a while. And then until they discovered an elephant has 220 million or billion neurons, <laughs> or say billion, yeah. billion. And well, how do now that measure can't work for us anymore if, if it was based on the billions of neurons we had. And it went to what you talked about. How are they packed? How are they designed? Is there something different about our neurons that made us develop the way we did and how to all it was it's it's super fascinating yeah. uh for those watching or listening if you go to netflix uh, there's a couple different series on explain they have different categories they do but there's one on mine there's yeah. one called animal intelligence and it's just really cool some of the things they share there's one even on it was a specific episode just on dogs yeah um the dog one i think you mentioned that one i think you saw that right I think it was somebody was in the class. They were talking like, about. I think so. It was narrated by. Uh, <laughs> I was like, yeah. what are we talking about? I was going to ask you want to hand out your Netflix password Sport, for yeah, all right. the people that might not have it. <laughs> but yeah, you know, everybody's got it. You just hand that thing out. Yeah, you know, I put it, leave it here at the school, and as people watch, so, like crazy. Um, I don't know if I saw something on Netflix about dogs, but my wife had watched something. I was telling you about this, and it's on Australian Netflix. Okay, and it's six cattle dogs that were from a similar from the same litter and they handed them out to six, six different trainers what's it called i feel like we you need the, we need the camera. person out there that <laughs> looks up things on yeah Google and pulls up the so screen behind us and check, says right? here you go <laughs> and she'll be disappointed that i can't remember it but the point was they they tracked these dogs over nine months in the hands of different trainers so you know they had 
they had different nurturing that was going on and it's just kind of cool to see how these dogs turned out and stuff but so what was the result were they all doing different yeah. training tasks and uh they were all doing similar training tasks which was like stockyard stuff okay and then the trainers didn't vary so wildly in how they were approaching mm. things but um it's just kind of cool anybody yeah. that appreciates yeah. dogs would love it yeah but somebody will look it up will say it say it later oh, but yeah Mustard dogs, that's it. <laughs> but if you're in the States, you'll be frustrated because you can't oh. really find it right now. So, like, next time you vacation yeah, Australia, yeah, then they yeah. well, can't actually. Well, somebody yeah. find it and tell the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. So, you get somebody dogs. with an Australian VPN so you can just have your Netflix tell you that you're in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All that crazy stuff. So, I also want, speaking of all this cool stuff, uh, Forrest, you and I had an opportunity uh, more than a few months ago now uh, in Arkansas in some off time at the seminar we were doing. Um, where we got to spend time with a legend trainer, Bob Bailey. Yeah. Um, and there was a really cool conversation piece that we had kind of sidebar. And you, I'm pretty sure, instigated the question with him about jackpot reward. I would love for you to share what yeah. that conversation was like and the takeaways that other, could, other people can learn from that conversation that you had with him because it was an excellent point about what we think and what really is. Yeah. Well, first of all, nobody expected Bob Bailey to be there. Yeah. So if anybody's listening, you should know who that guy is because yeah. a lot of the stuff that we do in dog training is kind of coined or it comes from him. Reward placement, for example. He called it reward for position. But I, I came to see you, right, to hang out with you and watch you because you're in command of your stuff and you're doing great stuff. And Pat Nolan was there and Simon Prince. And then when I walked in, I looked over in the corner and there's this little old guy sitting over <laughs> yeah, there. And I was yeah, like, hey, it looks a lot like <laughs> Bob Bailey. And not many people knew who it was, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot of military p folks there, yeah. Border Patrol people. I don't know, stuff that they just, he might not have penetrated, that name might, might not have penetrated. I felt like, though, at the end of the week, mm -hmm. a lot of people either had looked him up that night after yeah. he got like an introduction and then really appreciated it, but... Yeah, I beelined right to him. I was like, I'm Forrest. And he's like, oh, so? And I'm like, you're Bob Bailey. And, he's like, yeah. and just a so. totally cool, unassuming dude. So I was, um, he was there with, with Simon, and I was catching some of the stuff that they were doing in their uh, breakout groups. And he had said to a couple of people that were attempting to jackpot their dogs, he had, I think he had interjected at some point and said, you know, it's not really necessary. And he did speak a little bit to it before I'd asked him some questions on it, but he had said, you know, the jackpots, we don't really use them. They're, <clears throat> they feel better for, they're more for the trainer, right? Like you mm -hmm. feel good doing it, but it doesn't really serve what you're trying to accomplish in training. And um, so I asked him about like, well, what is it? What is a jackpot? <clears throat> and he had said, there was one, there was one person that he was overseeing that was training and the person had, clicked and was excited about what the dog did and, and wanted to jackpot him. And they had like 10 pieces of food in their hand. So they gave him all 10 pieces of food and he just looked at it and he's like, that's kind of a waste of resources. And so he said, you know, a, a true jackpot, if you had 12 pieces of food in your hand and you wanted to jackpot the dog or an animal, mm -hmm. Bob Bailey actually never trained a dog. He told me every other thing he's trained, but he never even owned one. I think one of his kids owned a dog, but he never owned a dog yeah. and he never trained a dog. Wow. That's, That's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah it's like, freaking amazing. Yeah. He's a seminal figure yeah. in the world of dog training. Yeah, he's never dude, had a yeah. dog. Yeah. That's, That's awesome. That's yeah. directly from the source, by the way. Okay, yeah. I had the so conversation like, oh, with him. Yeah. We're not Can't refute it. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, first of all, a true jackpot, it should happen if you're going to use it when there's an unexpected, and that's important, an unexpected and significant leap in performance. And so whatever the animal's doing, if, if you're surprised at one of the next trial shows up and there's this big leap in performance and it really catches you off guard, that would be the time to use it. And he said, for example, if you had 12 pieces of food in your hand and if you clicked and you threw down 12 pieces of food because you were attempting to jackpot them. He says, you've just wasted 10 pieces of food. Because mm -hmm. a true jackpot would be giving one piece at a time and letting the animal appreciate right. every instance of it. And what it does is it lets the animal, the dog, let's say, stay in reinforcement longer. Mm -hmm. So it's not just this moment exclaimed, this bit of this event or this bit of time. It's mm -hmm. the extent of time. So Simon had put something on his um, slides there and maybe I want to ask you about this because uh, I'm not sure I quite get it. Maybe you can chime in too. But he said reinforcement is not an event; it's a process. That makes a good sense. I like I I, I talk about uh, 
reward events. Yeah. But that also maybe encapsulates the idea that it's a single thing, mm-hmm. but it is, it's an, it's an ongoing process. Yep. It's an interactive thing. I say, of, I say event all the time, yeah. but I, think I it's both, but, but I, but I think, I think we're, it's semantics at a certain yep. point, right? What we're talking about though, is varying the length of that yep. and the intensity of those interactions yep. to, to increase value. Yep. Right. Yep. And that feels right. Right. You know, your dog doesn't care if you give them a fistful of food, but if you give them, six in a row then yep. they that keeps them in the re, in the reinforcement yep. longer so that makes perfect sense to me yep. uh also the the other place that's interesting to me jackpotting i I've, I've long kind of been i don't think jackpots do what we think they do kind mm-hmm. of thing uh cuz people use them he had it, when he what he's talking about would be the kind of place that I would consider using it, right? Okay, there was a really super good rep of something or a really good yep. leap forward. Yep. So you, you, a breakthrough, maybe. Yep. You were struggling to get a connection of some kind. The dog makes a big leap. You're like, yes, let's pay the hell out of that. Let's make this a, a big deal. Make, make an impression on them yep. for that. But lots of people use it um, when the dog's already doing something really well. Like, so that dog did a smoke and fast down. Like, well... That's all from your past reinforcement, yep. right? So jackpotting that doesn't do anything for that. The dog already was in the right state of mind. It's a waste of resources. It's a waste of resources. Say, yeah, yeah, you're giving rewards when yeah. you don't need to give rewards, yeah. which is a super interesting yes. discussion to have. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you best use your rewards and when are you giving empty rewards? And we all, if we're not paying attention, fall into the pattern where you're just yep. feeding your dog for no reason yep. or, you know, in a way yep. giving and it sort of undervalues that resource for other places where you exactly, want to use it. Yeah. If you get it really easily here for nothing, why do I care about it over here? Uh, so that's a, a really interesting. Yeah, question. I really liked the point you had made in our last detection class where you were saying about the motivation of the dog drives a lot of that stuff. Like the really fast downs, the dog doesn't go, ooh, that time I laid down two seconds faster. That's why I'm getting an extra treat. That's just a response to the motivation level and – kind of the fluency of that behavior at that point. And I think that makes total sense to be looking at it. Like how can I increase the dog's motivation to perform the behavior versus right. trying to pinpoint, oh, this time you did it extra fast. And you're aware of that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and almost like I, uh, I would think of if a dog comes in and they're in the wrong head space, you could use jackpots. They wouldn't be considered this way, but you could just start to develop, bring the dog into drive Mm-hmm. through reinforcement before you ask them to do something. Yep. It's like we we do in the teaching phase where you warm a dog up, like mm-hmm. reinforcement sampling almost, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Where I play with you a little bit, and then we go into training. I do some dynamic food get games, you feed you, right get you in the right state of mind before, mind before I ask, I ask you to ask do the you things to, I want you to exactly, do with that state of right. mind. Yeah. Instead so, of asking you to do something and then responding to your attitude about having done yep. it, right? So, so what happened after that weekend with Bob mm-hmm. is I cut my dog training food bill in half. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me right. I yeah. got real stingy, bro. <laughs> yeah. Cut out those, those jackpots that it, weren't serving it was, me. I hadn't thought about it in that way until that conversation yeah, occurred. There was something else that happened, too. So there, there was some, you know, like eager dogs that they were working in that, in that pod, the, the Simon Bob pod. And when people started being a more methodical, let's say, with their jackpot, one piece at a time, it calmed the dogs down. Yeah, so I there was one, one Malinois that, a puppy that was really, like, pumped up, and the guy was clicking and giving him handfuls of food, and, and you could see Bob was kind of cringing a little bit as much as he could. <laughs> so he stepped in and gave some really – he doesn't cringe, just sits back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Always smiling. And yeah. nice, nice. But he stepped in and gave him great instruction, and he said, like, let him appreciate, you know, every piece of that food. And so when the guy um, started, you know, operating that way, giving him a piece, and, and the dog learned some patience there while it was receiving things, and the state, the, the mentality shifted. And the training then, the reps, the trials became very productive. The dog got more on yeah. point. It cut through some of the, the BS. It matches something I heard Ian Dunbar share on Ivan's podcast. Mm. There was a, um, he, I guess he developed a treat that was like the powder of something. So basically he could just puff it in the dog's face. Dog could lick it and get the particles, air particles of it, let's say. And all he had to do is puff, 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 go back to training. 
so it didn't have to like eat something, slow down, do all this stuff. And he talked about how inefficient, how efficient it was in the training, but then how he could puff, wait, puff, wait, puff. And it liked this puff. That sounds disappointing to me. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's yeah. Like, but, it's but, it's all, but this is maybe why we don't see it no anywhere. It was the a dog real. That works for the pumped powdered rewards. It's yeah. got to be very highly food motivated. <laughs> yeah, the essence of food in the air is enough to motivate me. Right. And, and I, I don't know if I'm <laughs> quoting exactly right, but he was uh, bringing up like the flavor was really what got the dog excited. There was something about it that was Because, yeah, because yeah, they eat it so fast anyway that when they did this, they kind of got, you know, based on what, how he described it, uh, a very similar effect got because yeah. most treats are inhaled so fast that yeah. it's a similar concept. But it, but the way he described it is similar to that way of that elongating the process of reward, like one, one, yep. one kind of thing versus a bunch. Yep. And, and it did. It, it made me reevaluate, just like, like you said, and it piggybacks things I had heard you say recently, too, about how that jackpot, I think jackpot got popular as a term. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. And through via social media, whatever, the industry just said, this is something and it caught fire. Yes. And the initial interpretation of how what jackpot was in the psychology world or animal psychology aspect got turned into a normal dog trainer that meant it means lots of treats right. versus multiple treats spread out over time. And the time part is, I think, the critical part most people don't understand, is it, which is your reward event. Right. That period of time, that, that more that we get to interact with them in a reward way, whether it be extended play, more treats over the period yeah. of time, the time is the critical part of the jackpot, not necessarily. One of them, or, the, yeah. or, or the intensity of the... Magn- of, the of magnitude the, of the, the magnitude of the of the reinforcer, whether whether it's yeah. this is something that you are crazy for, or the, all the movement stuff mm-hmm. that we typically yep. do, right? Yep. So we certainly play a lot on the dog's desire mm-hmm. for dynamics and movement yep. and activity, right? So yeah, some of our food work can be very static, very stationary yeah. work, and th- you st- still can have dogs motivated for that. The, the the movement part changes everything, right? Just yeah, and it, we have that benefit working with dogs. Keep, keep we always keep in mind Bob was training everything but dogs. Yeah, so yeah, like yeah. dogs. We have we, yeah, Ch- we have chickens some that weren't like chasing food. Dogs. <laughs> we, have some, <laughs> we have some shortcuts, right? Yes. For sure, absolutely. And we have a very willing participant when it comes Crazy to yeah to Absurdly engagement yeah. aspect. Yeah, and and speaking of the engagement part of it, I think some of the things that maybe gets lost in the training translation is how do we engage? Like the importance of the engagement, like what you bring up frequently is some of the mechanics of how we play, not just playing. And those mechanics have certain reasons for it to keep dogs within a certain drive state or not over threshold, not being boring and just being a Pez dispenser. Right. Um, Speak a little bit about for you, Michael, from your point of view, the importance of that process that, you know, how we can make this, the play mechanics, the engagement aspect more beneficial for a dog than just playing rough or throwing something frequently kind of thing. I I think for me, and I think Forrest is uh, definitely on the same page this way that both of us spend a fair amount of time noodling around with the dogs to figure out what activates them and what they like, right? So I think that's part of the problem is, and I've talked about this a lot, mm-hmm. but people step into training and right away they're focused on the behavior creation and getting the dog to do something instead of just interacting with the dog, with food, with toys, with movement, with physical touch, mm-hmm. all these things to kind of figure out what the dog, what activates that dog, what, what gets them to buy in. Right. Mm-hmm. And it may be your, of course, the simple things like trying different kinds of treats and, you know, whether how much the dog's getting to eat and all that kind of stuff and, or movement mm-hmm. and play is the same way when you play with the dog. Yep. Some dogs just like to, you know, like, like the, a lot of chasing stuff. Other dogs like it if you roughhouse with them a little bit. So I think the idea of trying to teach the dog how to be rewarded, like mm-hmm. to build uh, an activity, wh- whether I'm using food or anything, that the dog enjoys and do that on its own 
with that as its own, um, for its own sake at a point. And when it starts to feel good, like, hey, that dog's into this today. And I haven't asked them for anything yet. Mm -hmm. That's the point at which you sort of start training, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so then you know you have something of value. You're not out there going like, oh, I'm trying to get you to do something here to have this. And they're like, I don't want that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or I don't care enough about it. There's a lot, I've been preaching a lot lately about what I call empty repetitions versus committed repetitions, mm -hmm. you know, where the dog's bought in and they're, you can tell they care enough mm -hmm. that that repetition moved the needle. And with your discussion of, Bob saying that wasted resources. Yep. I feel that a lot. Like I rewarded the dog there. That dog did not care enough about the reward. It wasn't working for it. Yeah. Yep. yeah. They that's not it. what they were. They did whatever for. it was. And I'm like, nope, they're not in it. Yep. And that's a wasted reward. Yep. Yeah. Because every of those you give, the dog has less in the tank for the next thing you want, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So it's finding a way so that all of your repetitions are invested. Yeah. yeah. And along with the well, we're talking about rewards, we're talking about jackpots, mm -hmm. we're talking about not wasting resources, a term that he was throwing around, or I don't know if it's a term, but behavioral economics. Yes. Right, and so it's the magnitude of the reinforcer is enough to support the expense of the behavior. Mm -hmm. So whatever it takes for that dog to do it, on the other side of what they gain is enough. Mm -hmm. And having, and what they gain being too much is a waste of resources, what they have the game being not enough means the behavior don't, will fail to exist. It'll extinguish itself. And so that's stuff we know as dog trainers anyway. Like intuitively, mm -hmm. you're like, hey, man, if I'm going to heal my dog for a mile, like it's going to equal something great. It's got to. And yeah. then uh, if I'm going to, if my dog offers me a sit that they've been doing for, you know, forever, I'll give them a piece of kibble if, if that, right? Sure. I right. To, I'm not tossing the ball for five minutes yeah. for a simple <laughs> right, sit right, or right, whatever. Right, right. So long as they're doing But that, I think we know that intuitively as, as trainers. Like yeah. We're always weighing that, like, is this worth it for you? Do I have you bought into your mm -hmm. conversation? And so you're playing around with that stuff. I would, uh, I'd be cu really curious um, to talk to him because a, a lot of um, his work seems focused on the, dog, the animal simply executing the behavior and whether or not um, quality of the behavior enters into the reinforcement process in his mind. Mm. Like, my dog did it, but did they do it crazy fast, right? So we, in dog mm. training, in the sport world at least, we're frequently trying to manipulate the aesthetics of the whole thing too, mm -hmm. right? So... Yeah, my dog will heel around and look at me for this amount of time, but we do it with animation mm -hmm. and other stuff there, mm -hmm. and um, and whether where the emotion comes in, the emotion, the behavioral economics of that, mm -hmm. in a sense, mm -hmm. like how much more do I need the dog invested? Because we we're talking about this a lot lately. This idea about the am the amount of motivation slash arousal slash whatever that's necessary for the task that's in front of you right now, right? And as sport trainers, we typically put the dog higher mm. for everything mm. with the idea that over time, I want them to not just do these things. I want them to do these things, mm. right? Like fully fast mm -hmm. as you can kind of stuff like that. And where the line is for that stuff is constantly interesting to me now because over the years, and I don't have a, uh, a, a concrete way of thinking about this, but over the years, there are some dogs that you – this idea that we teach something at a slightly lower arousal level, like I'm going to show you, get you at a level where you're bought in, but you're not bouncing off the ceiling to show you how to do certain things. And once you start to understand them, I start to try to turn up the volume so that you, you're fluent in the behavior, but you do it with more energy, right? And some dogs seem to stick. Like, wh however they learned it in the beginning, that's where they stay. You, They learned it at that thing and you try to pump them up and they can get pumped up, but they don't transfer it into that behavior, whether oh, they're like conditioned to that behavior. Mm -hmm. And other dogs do that really well. Mm -hmm. Like you, you Malinois frequently, you, you teach them down here, like, okay, like make sure you do this stuff. And then you amp it up and they maintain it and they amp up. Mm -hmm. But I've encountered dogs that, that didn't. So there is a dog that benefits from you having them higher from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And but it's harder to manipulate them there, which is yeah. all just an offshoot. I'm constantly fascinated by that and mm -hmm. trying to find where the sweet spot is. And this ties really well into detection, where we have in training set up typically multiple finds, mm -hmm. and each find 
in most cases where detection dog handlers are training, give the same reward each time. And depending on back to those early stages of training, there's the aspect of A, is the handler an adversary to the dog over the reward item and the bleed over of those things that affect multiple reps? Mm -hmm. Or going into the need of, do I need to pay them this same reward every time they find odor? Or can we, or should we use a some type of variable which gets brought into the detection dog world frequently? By Simon Gebois. So he, yeah, that was he. He talked about that quite a bit too. That was another. That's another person. Was he talking about variable reinforcement, or was he talking about what the non-contractual what? relationships with terminal markers? Okay. Yep. Yep. Click feed you. Sometimes click not, not feed, feed you. you. How do you feel about not and being what was fed? His take and how does it affect your return right. to work? Right. Uh, the jury was out. He was still doing that work. That was at a Sparks conference in 2014. We yeah, started yeah. presenting that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It feels a bit like a like a Skinner box. Like you, mm -hmm. yeah. you miss your chance. You go back to work, then you get jackpotted. Right. But they were rescuing border collies anyway. I just correct. No, no, no. That was that's a great example. Actually, yeah. he's one of the guests I want to have on this year. Yeah, to go it's into Simone. that more. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I think he used to chase foxes around up in like Canada. <laughs> yeah, now he's rescuing. No, you're right. Collies. He does he's sell something. Yeah, he did yeah. share that something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, but the very, and I'll bring it back to again to Bob because that was another conversation that came up was variable reward, and share that part what he discussed because that's another little interesting category that should be discussed, and those that can take it and apply it to detection. Yep, and he said people were throwing that around a lot, like yeah. just vary the reward schedule on that, vary the reward, and then he just piped up and he said, you know, we we never really used variable reinforcement schedules and. And everybody looked at him like, do you even train, bro? <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what do you mean? That's what do you expect do from it? a guy right, right. who doesn't train dogs? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I should, I should actually clarify. Of course, Bob Bailey has been responsible for, like, the training Lots of, of dogs, many, many it? dogs. Yeah. And he's influenced, like, yeah. you know, yeah. it more than anybody. But I, the point was he had never owned one himself, is yeah. what he said. But he just, he had said that, um, you know, the animal's always working. They always, they're always meeting the goal, which is to get through reinforcement. So... If you are putting two known behaviors together, so I'll think about like a retrieve and a healing pattern, mm -hmm. and I've always rewarded my retrieve, but one day I, I decide to connect it to my healing that I've always rewarded. And just because I don't reward on the retrieve, but I reward on the healing that's attached to it. In the dog's mind, they still got rewarded, still continuous. It's a that's, continuous work. It's a, yeah. yeah, it's one trial. I've just combined two known things. And so... So truly, truly not like a true variable reinforcement mm -hmm. schedule is if I'd go out for a training session and, put, and work my dog for 15 minutes and put them in their crate and, and never reward and not reward them at the end and then put yeah. them in their crate or take them on a walk. Then I haven't paid them for, for the work that they've done. But even if I practiced 12 things within it and I pay them at the end, they still got it. It's yeah. still continuous. Mm -hmm. That was something I think they said they don't. never just didn't reward the animal at the end. The dolphin never didn't come back and get sex and food, you know, exactly. after it went plug the homing beacon on the ship. Yeah, or whatever right, 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 right. And that's just good to think about because we, and it's not wrong. It's like, yeah, I don't reward the retrieve every time. It's like, yeah, how, how the hell are you going to get further down right. the line? And put a pro, how are you going to put a program together if you right. don't stop rewarding? And I think, I think it's a little bit of semantics again. No. So I think. When we're, we tend to break it down when we're talking about this initially, we're talking about individual behaviors instead of discrete trials that have multiple behaviors in them, right? Uh, yep. Entire training sessions. Yep. And so if we're looking at that, then of course we're on variable reinforcement. My yep. dog doesn't get rewarded for every sit that it does and doesn't get rewarded for every down that it does. Yep. Now, all those things are on variable reinforcement. But if you look at it that way, it's moral, then you're right. The dogs are getting a paycheck at some point it's just it's gonna, just, happen. It's gonna yeah. happen somewhere whether it's after the trial yeah. it's over uh, at the very end sometimes it's right it, wherever right yeah. uh, and so that's true yep. to some degree you're not you could i mean i suppose you can and and i'm now i'm, ju I'm just curious uh, there are I've certainly done trials with my dog where I haven't played with them after the trial, yeah. right? Yeah. So there yeah. have been non-reinforced. Because you want to know, like, how, what if, how yeah, it affects so them. Yeah, does it affect them? And, yeah. and what my experience is, it doesn't affect them at all if you have a strong reinforcement history yeah. ahead of that, right? And, yeah, dogs that like to work, they like to they work. They like to so work. You've yeah. built you've built a, yeah. a, a kind of workaholic, yeah. as it were, at a certain yeah. stage. And so at the end, you, you'll have to field and... There, 
that you don't reinforce them traditionally. I yeah. should say there's something else maybe. But it's just in, it's just something interesting yeah. to think about. No, and so. I, well, and it got my wheels turning. What, what I think what Cameron's trying to tease out of this was a little bit was we've been having discussions uh, a fair bit about variable reinforcement at um, indication for detection dogs, right? And traditionally, every single repetition, every time the dog finds something, they're paid, mm -hmm. right? It is the, the training kind of methodology, the idea behind it. People are like, no, your dog found it. you got to reward them, right? You gotta yeah. to, if you don't reward them, they're going to stop yeah. finding it, right, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. But, of course, we don't do that for every other yeah. activity. And That's obedience, right. we certainly don't. And you could, if you've done the foundation work right, then those behaviors sh should actually improve, right? Mm -hmm. Because what happens is to your, now I'm going to go off in the weeds here, but you're just yes. talking, <laughs> talking about what Simone was talking about then. I'm going to get, get my weed whacker out, baby. The effect, of, <laughs> the effect of defying a dog's expectation of reward, Check. right? So I've built an expectation that you're going to get reinforced for this, and then the first time I don't reinforce you and what what's the dog how do you how feel do how do you that? go back to work right. do you go yeah. back to do work, back to work? How, how what quality is the work mm -hmm. and we're looking for dogs that generally speaking when we start talking about working type dogs they get frustrated a little bit and they try harder yep. usually mm -hmm. there's an uptick usually in their energy and yep. things like that they're like hey i'd normally get rewarded here and you ask them to do something else and they're like well come on where is it like it's adversity yeah yeah mm -hmm. and so there there's a positive Assuming they're not the kind of dog that goes off the cliff and starts biting people. barking, <laughs> biting yeah. people, yeah, that kind yeah. of thing. There's a positive <laughs> thing there, but I suppose that it's likely, and likely if they look at it, it's going to turn out to be that some dogs feel defeated by that, and they bring less energy, and other dogs get jacked up over it, and it's probably, and this is me just yeah. guessing. Uh, that it's uh, probably a function of their genetic package. Like, there's going to be some dog that's going to be like, "All right, you're not paying me anymore. I'm done." Right. Like, and then other dogs like, "God damn yeah. it! Where's the <laughs> next reward?" Right. I think a lot of the human is yeah. the one that's the most upset. You know, they're the most either fearful or, well, I think I should have rewarded my dog for whatever the reason. And were you going to add something? I to was that? just going to say, I, I think like going to your guys point about like you have a whole healing pattern, right? Like a whole obedience routine, like I, that feels okay. Right. To like move from like a sit to a down and there's not rewards for every behavior, but it, it feels like you're still like kind of in it with them mm -hmm. and in detection, like you don't, it doesn't feel the same transition like that because the mm -hmm. dog's going through a whole behavior sequence on their own sort of, and you're not really involved. And then they go into indication and that's the moment if, and it yeah. feels more like, like leaving at the end of the trial and not doing anything. And it mm -hmm. feels like kind of dirty as a right. trainer, like, <laughs> uh, you know, it's kind of a powerful point because yeah. part of yes. you know, the way that we train is the dog earns the progression of the work. Right. Like that's the reinforcement right. is mm -hmm. you didn't get paid here. You get to carry on and do more work. Right. Right. And so to your point, like they're still in it. And, and at some point, you know, the moment's going to happen, but so yeah. there's, I, but I think detection could be set up with transitions mm -hmm. that make that happen. Mm -hmm. Right. So whatever signal we, you give the dog there. And then when you're first doing that, I wouldn't just end like that. When I talk about going yeah. off the field with the dog at the end, that's a, a finished dog, right? A dog that has a really long thing. So at that point, if I don't reward them at once, twice, five times, they're not going to quit working, right? right? Um, and so in the early stages of that for detection dogs, I would think the idea would be they, they, the first time you're introducing the idea that you might not get paid every single time you find something, uh, the dog finds it, you give them some signal, good dog, right? But not one of their conditioned rewards or anything like that. And then quickly you, put you them quick, back quickly put them back onto another search. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Like another all right, ready another opportunity. Yeah. They do the second yeah. search, more work to get to it, yeah. and then they pay, you pay that and one. And what do you yeah. think, Michael, about like when you're introducing that concept, doing it within, you know, something like a lineup where you can move quickly I from I think that would be the indication. best place to yeah. do it. Yeah. And, a, and it's a really small behavior chain. You're not going through the entire, a big search, right, with a lot of effort. Yeah. And the, yeah, gray, and the gray perfect. area is very small. Yeah, yeah so exactly. Gray. But, like, you could take a dog off of a field and still have them in behavior and have them think oh, they're still course. working. Right? Oh, yeah, right. that, well, which was the track. traditional thing in sport world. Mm -hmm. I mean, do an entire obedience routine, heal off the field, and then go play in the parking lot, yeah. right? 
So the, the dog never really yep. stopped working, yep. and, yep. The, and the pay, there was the yep. paycheck at the end, right? I think so. the other kind of scary aspect in detection, and again, a lot of this goes back to, like, humans looking at it going, like, this is my perception of it, so I'm scared because this, this, and this. But detection isn't necessarily just because it's odor, so it's not very black and white. So there's another kind of scary idea that, like, what if my dog – wasn't like 110% sure like what if the odor was slightly different this time or there was another level of contamination they hadn't seen and they go into indication and they're making kind of a generalization within that moment Ooh. and then that's oh, the one that's that really I don't reinforce God, <laughs> well, well this is why no, that's, a, that's, that's an amazing that's an amazing yeah. point yeah. And I, like I hadn't even really thought about it because you could have a dog performing an indication that was a not fully committed indication and right. you might not see that in that you moment, wouldn't really right? know because and that's we where can't people, perceive yeah. the yeah. odor maybe the like odor it. sucked and it was like yeah. a huge leap in performance and you need to be jackpotting <laughs> that <laughs> exactly <laughs> right Try it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well to, back to that point you made a second ago this is why you do you introduce this during those controlled settings right where we have a, a better understanding of yeah. what is happening with the odor itself or how it's presented and yeah. those kind of conditions. And therefore, when your what-if scenario okay. occurs, yeah. it's not nearly as, as detrimental. And I think... <laughs> and you would say, if in doubt, pay the dog, right? Correct. So if you're not feeling good about it, then sure. just pay the dog. And also, it's where it comes into the progression. Like, a dog in development, no, like a dog with some continuous. season that's like you you know that you have strong searching you have strong indications at that point you, you you've, you're going to feel there's safer question marks it's, a, it's the same question we ask yeah. in obedience or whatever anything yeah. all the time mm -hmm. it's like when is the first time that i'm not reinforcing you for the behavior i'm asking it's certainly not while you're still gaining fluency yeah. meaning if if you can't do it when i ask you without a bunch of help then i'm I'm not putting you on variable reinforcement there, but yeah. The other part of that though too is where a lot of people try to fit detection is cross disciplines. And there are many detection disciplines that only get one find. Like they deploy the dog, they mm -hmm. find one thing, the thing, mm -hmm. the dog is put away, they investigate, locate, do whatever. Then there's another detection discipline, let's say like nose work or human remains, where there's multiple indications or multiple mm -hmm. finds, and that itself has to be trained and expected. So then where this kind of meshes and has this overlapping where confusion comes in is because the dogs, let's say a bomb dog, in training, they may have four or five finds in training, but in reality, that dog alerts one time, they're out. Mm. They're not going to go run right away and go find another one. Because there's certain protocols or action yeah, on fine. We gotta get some <laughs> we're, 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 Yeah, we got shit to do. Like, yep. <laughs> like, ah! I'll be the dog are running out of the room. Yep. Like, Let's go find it. It's over there, there somewhere. <laughs> there's that shirt. Says, if you see the bomb dog running, try to keep up. Yeah. <laughs> the, but this is where that confusion comes in because they treat training in one way, mm. and then the reality is totally different. Yeah. You, you wouldn't necessarily, this is where the that variable aspect may not even need to come into play under a certain discipline of detection. Well, I think, though, that it could be valuable, any discipline you do, because it's going to strengthen the No, no, I get it, but that's where where I look at it, this is where the confusion comes sure, in, yeah, is right, right. because yeah. of that. Well, but I, I don't think, need variable, because I don't have multiple finds. Exactly. Right. Yeah, we don't want to go to that extreme, yeah. but where the confusion is, training is so heavily focused one way, reality the other and they did a bunch of things over here well that's a that's yeah. another thing altogether we were having this discussion the other day that that from too way too many trainers the finished product yep. doesn't look like they're mm -hmm. training right mm -hmm. and so introducing it in training would be good for those dogs because you know mm -hmm. in the professional world in the real world at some point other things are going to interrupt your ability to reinforce they're your dog. Experience it, they're so going to experience it. They're going to experience it. So you've already prepared time. them for that. So when they don't get reinforced there that time, it's not a big deal yeah. because it's happened to them in training and, and you don't damage your behavior. Otherwise, you get dogs that recognize on the street, I don't get paid. Correct. And so their searching drops off there. And right? it's the same thing you guys do. You prepare dogs for there's not an order available. So you're not Correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, and it right. goes into this is the part like uh, – where Michael has seen us talk about this even more frequently that we do the classes together is I try to impart 
the aspect of thinking this way. Don't make training your vending machine all the time. Mm-hmm. Make training start to look like a slot machine. Mm-hmm. And when you create that, well, it's not every single time something happens, then they start working, like back to that point, I may work a little bit harder or I can handle continuing on in my search to go find another. So that way the, the behavior increases. What happens frequently is, you know, tr- training is your vending machine. And it's this constant payout. Then all of a sudden, I'll spin this in the, in the professional realm. In training, let's say law enforcement's doing narcotics detection. This training day, they put out all their hides. The dog finds everything. They do cars. They do rooms, etc. Then in reality, they go do a traffic stop. The dog alerts the car. They pull the dog off. They're like, you know, good boy. They, that's all the most they get out of it. This happens every real traffic stop. So in that condition, the dog's like, well, traffic stops suck. Trial because wise. exactly, yeah, trial yeah. exactly, right. and this is what happens because the handlers have been told by their trainers, you don't know what that dog's alerting to. You don't want to accidentally reinforce something else because you don't know. And that's the part I throw back at them. If you don't know that answer, if you are afraid that your dog indicate and your dog indicates that's what it's trained to do, and you don't reward because you're fearful of either adding something else or you're not sure why. Why are you out there? Why are you doing this? If you are, if your duty in your job is protecting people's Fourth Amendment search and seizure rights, and you're fearful of that, you shouldn't be doing it. If you are incorporating this in training, where sometimes a reward happens, sometimes it's just praise. Like you know, this is where the use of condition reinforcers come in really nicely. Is I can mark the rewarding experience the dog is happening mentally. I can then follow that up with what I want to, and I can vary that. It can be the praise, it can be the toy, it can be whatever I choose to do based on the certain situation I'm in. And let's just say I'm playing devil's advocate for the cop. Well, I get the alert of the car, I can mark, and I can do my job. Because I may not want to play with a toy on the side of the roadway or get stuck myself engaging with my dog. And let's say... Joe bad guy right there just saw the dog alert, sees me all happy, goes, oh, right, the fight's on now. Mm-hmm. Now I'm tactfully at a disadvantage. I've been playing with my dog, and all of a sudden he pulls, you know, whatever happens. Mm-hmm. So I understand the procedural aspect, okay, for safe. But we have to incorporate that in training, and that's where a lot of that drops yeah. off is training looks like this, where it's a big, fun party. They get the best thing every time. And the real world becomes a picture that is not reinforced. Correct. Exactly. Enough cues, things yep. get cri- contributing that the dog is convinced. Yep. So. And then I see in the sport world where there's reinforcement pretty much for everything, but they do create the cue of find another. And I've seen lots of dogs go, okay, I understand. I need to go to the next thing. Which is not, really cool to see when yeah. the dogs, when people have trained that so strong that the, like, it's like the dog has no change at all, even like going right past that same odor they've already found and they can work. Yeah. We can cool. work another one right next to it. And a different odor. Yeah. So well, they, well, they it's just like a, a value a, a signal You don't go back to the same find, right? So okay. a lot of times at the beginning of training, yep. the dog finds something, you reinforce them and then you let them go back. Like, yeah, show me again. Yep. Right. Kind of thing. Well, at a certain point, that one that you found is dead. Yep. Now you got to find another one. Yeah, we're on so the they next put that game. on cue, that and the cool. dogs won't won't go back to the one yep. that's there, even though they know there's odor yep. there. There's just that that odor gives them reinforcement. Yep. And gives the dog a lot of cool. credit. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really cool to watch it. Like yeah. I've had dogs, you know, that just come for a lesson or whatever. And if you don't know, they like they're already at that point and the dogs are not gonna re-hit it. And you'll like even if you change the orientation, like do a lineup or something and change the orientation, they're like, No, that's the same one. Like they could recognize wow, just that's that it's cool. mm-hmm. that's even if that's it's really in cool. a different spot, yeah. like that's the same odor and that how I many, just hit on. Like how many odor people would that really bother right like that certain ones would bother them a lot because yeah. they're like i don't want my dog walking that odor yeah. it should always tell me that something's right. there yeah. no. and in that context it's not it's actually counterproductive because they need to move on to the next one because they're under that watch yeah. you know that clock's going yeah. it, it, it reminds me of uh i know uh, michael's heard of it quite a bit maybe you have too um in the search and rescue world they deal with an indication that's a find refind there's a complexities in that and mm-hmm. what you're requiring the dog to do Dogs is that bounce back after they, they yeah, find the thing. Right. Yeah, they, right. Get you. Yeah, they right. find right. whether it be live or it, I've seen it used in both cases. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll go with cadaver for the example. The dog finds the remains, does its behavior that they want it to do. 
Then it has to leave, run, find its handler, bring the handler forward to where it did it, and then do the behavior again. Mm. So frequently, where does reinforcement happen in that sequence? A lot is back at the handler. Well, it's with the handler regardless. With the handler, so there's yeah. no reinforcement away from the handler. That's the at part. All, of, right? Yeah, so, you're getting to that part. Yeah, of the, yep, the, there's a, a lack of dedication to the end part of the chain, right? Mm-hmm. Where do you want the most dedication? It's mm-hmm. a reward placement issue. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I have the toy always. Like you go find it. You got to come back to me, mm-hmm. and then you got to take me back there again. And then when I finally get there, guess what? I'm the one that's the source of your reward mm-hmm. again. So where's the value? Mm-hmm with the handler instead of with the odor, right? So I, I think that I have my my <laughs> bias against the fine refine thing. Yeah, same. And I, that if you were going to and if you were going to teach it, I would have done a ton of reward at source first Correct. before I started teaching the dog yeah. to come back and get me so that their reinforcement like that's history the that's yeah. the default like where the thing is is what's the important part, the odor there. Uh, is what's important, or scent in this case, yeah. right? If it's yeah. Ah. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, there you go. See? Depending uh, on, yeah. I learned that <laughs> at our Arkansas <laughs> weekend. Yeah. Well, there's a difference between, I started using odor, I was like, yeah. scent work. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. odor actually. much more yeah. now. Well, <laughs> and, and the unique part that where that find, refind kind of was most popular was with live find. Yeah, because it's, they'd it's have like victim reward. Star. Yeah, yeah, and because victim could reward like now. Way behind the dog has to close the gap. But are we saying here that the danger is a la- like a loss of commitment? Cor- yeah. Well, that's the biggest yeah. complaint. And that the, the dogs c- don't want to range away from you either. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. you also have problems where the dog wants to keep close to you yeah. because you're the yeah. where, they, where the reward is, and so they don't want to get out away from you. Yeah. And that's the they the, look back a lot, like where are you? Yeah, it you sounds like close, a lot of right? sendaways so. I see in the sport world where yeah, people exactly. are sending their dogs like yeah. you know, around cones or and, and that's when, fine, just not for IPO. When right. they reach out to us, they that's the concern they bring up is well, my dog isn't committed to source as much as I like. And in the lie find aspect, the victim can engage with the dog in training. They'll have the person with the toy and they can engage. But then when they try to do the same game, but now it's cadaver, so there's now no engagement, then this is where the wheels kind of fall off in the training. Yeah, cadaver is uh, much more like a detection problem. Correct. Like, yeah, we talked like about that. Not like lie find stuff in that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. And, and that's where I think the biggest uh, the conversations like this become helpful for that community to realize, well, I need to do – reward placement and engagement aspects with the reward in that location will help versus what they're constantly dealing with and with their reinforcement history so strong of handler having reward Mm -hmm. we can overcome that with just a change of location and reinforcement and again back to the use of conditioned reinforcers would really help mm-hmm. clear that like, up. Yeah, the strength of your conditioning to the odor in that sense would have to yeah, be yeah. really powerful yeah. before yeah. you'd risk adding like Length of searching and distance and all that, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Surely not the bounce so, back thing yet. Good yeah. golly. <laughs> it, it is, and it's super, and it, when you look at it, it's, it's a number of behaviors exactly. all. <laughs> Good golly, not that. Yes. That's the formula, folks. <laughs> there it is. Forrest Mickey, people. Yeah. He's, got <laughs> yes. he's got it. He's got it. He's got it for you. I idea what I'm talking <laughs> Yes, you do. Well, it's kind of funny, right? Because the issue that they end up creating, like, kind of negates the need for a refine. Like, my mm. dog won't range away from me now. That's and the right. whole reason you needed a refine is because your dog is well, supposed so to be far way away. far you away from you. where they yeah, are. Yeah. That's exactly well, true. just need to start Oh, you're right there. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Dog's like 15 Just feet away. Like. It just needs to be runners out there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so now I, I'm I'm stuck on something you said in passing before, and I'm not going to remember it correctly, but the I, idea of was Simone talking about um, not reinforcing uh, after your conditioned reinforcer all the right. time? Right, right. Dog would go and find the thing. They'd click. Dog had yep. learned that the click equaled reward, yep. but they just wouldn't pay at that time, and that they'd time. send them back to yeah. work. Yep. So yep. they'd still mark. They yep. wouldn't yep. have any uh-huh. other signal. Yep. It was the yep. same one, condition reinforced. And I've certainly done it yeah. in training, mm-hmm. um, but not in a not in a consistent way, because yeah. normally at the point we're using our condition reinforcer, we're releasing the dog from the behavior, so why not pay it, yeah. right, yeah. considering they're keeping it high. But maybe after the creation of expectation there, if you violate that dog's expectation, you get a bump in behavior. Yeah. And... That's why now I, I want to know what he found out. Yeah. Um, yeah. You got to have him on. <laughs> and I, I, I should say this is what, 
eight years ago, yeah. six, nine years ago, and a lot's happened since then. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, of course. Yeah. But this, this is how I remember it because it, it stuck out to me because I thought a non-contractual relationship with yes. a clicker, that bothered me a lot or whatever yeah. your marker is. Yeah, because uh, we, we've and thought he was interested it. in that space. Yeah, because we've thought about it to, uh, 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 through classical conditioning and the idea that with classical conditioning, you want to kind of keep it charged up. Yep. You want to keep the value there yep. and that... Uh, Classical conditioning can be extinguished yeah. with enough yep. of those. Is the conditioning like operant behavior in the sense that this is something we need Stuart for? Yeah, yeah. Let's leave this one. in Stuart territory. Yeah, yeah. we'll have to come yeah. back. Because right, I'm really yeah. fascinated with classical conditioning these days, like yeah. in a big way. Like, I think it's the most important part of yeah. all dog training Which, now. Is like, there something, we talked with with Dr. Stuart Hilliard recently, Michael and I, we had a Zoom call, and uh, Michael just had said, like, I don't think I understand it anymore. What do you got to say? Is there something that you, <laughs> yeah, that you so left that Zoom call with that you could... Uh, no, no, I, I don't have anything up? yet. I need okay. to spend some time with him, because he's very fluent in the literature and from human psychology and everything else, and I'm, I'm not. Um, and I've always just gone with a simple analogy that classical conditioning is like a battery, right? You're making associations mm -hmm. between neutral stimuli mm -hmm. and something meaningful to the dog. And if this predicts that enough times, the dog starts to recognize that and you're charging up your battery kind of thing. And there's a connection that's made. And the more times it predicts it, the bigger the charge in the battery up to the point where the battery is basically fully charged. Mm -hmm. And every time you use it and don't follow it with the predicted consequence, uh, the, the predicted reinforcement in our, in our case, that you've used some battery charge. Well, of course, it took you time to build that up. So doing that yeah. sum isn't going to gonna wreck its yep. value. Yep. Um, but does it work like operant conditioning in the sense that once you violate the dog's expectations and it's on a variable, like Sapolsky's discussion, do we get a bigger dopamine spike yeah. when they're anticipating that? Is it Does it energize behavior mm -hmm. or does it work the opposite way? Mm -hmm. And uh, like I have experimented a little bit and have some anecdotal things, but mm -hmm. I work with it, I, my own dogs and my own dogs are the kind of dog that typically when you don't, they're expecting something, you don't give it to them, they get frustrated. Mm -hmm. And if I've done my work right, that frustration is a bump and drive which they put in put more effort into the task I'm asking yeah. them to do, mm -hmm. right? Is that true across all dogs? Is that mm -hmm. where's the point at which you're damaging something with that? Mm -hmm. And so now I'm currently very interested in that, right? <laughs> right? And I don't know whether it works the that same way. And I think it's probably also um, behavior driven, like classical conditioning um, str uh, affects certain types of behaviors more than it does others. In, in a sense, right? So, like, um, if I'm conditioning something with predatory type rewards, I'm going to have a different um, kind of durability of that behavior than if I'm doing it with something that the dog doesn't have internal value for, yeah. right? Exactly. Like if I'm using yep. food versus toys, yep. that changes things, yep. right? Because the, the self-reinforcing aspect of the predatory thing triggers certain biological yeah, they're still they're still getting they're still getting something out of that. They're still where juicy sometimes not so much with the food rewards yep. or other things. Anyway, so that my brain is in a funny place around classical conditioning right now. Yeah. and, and <laughs> I just it was I I chuckled because yeah, Mike Ellis calls me and he's like. I'm not sure I understand classical conditioning anymore. <laughs> yeah. like, I used to think it was the simple one. The sky one. <laughs> is falling. Holy shit. Yeah. Let's get Doc on the phone. Oh, find out what's going I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. I'm going to call him you, all right, dude? Yeah, <laughs> I can't awesome. believe this shit right now. You want to so train true. dogs or what? It, 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 it gives the, te the testament of there's still so much we have to learn. Yeah. You know, we, we share so many things. Um, one of those being the dopamine aspect, but yet there's been no research specifically about dopamine on dogs. Yeah. There's dopamine on primates and a bunch of other things, but the same kind of studies, do dogs react this way for a toy or a food? Or they do, They've done some cool things with the MRI brain scans and showing mm -hmm. things, and uh, that stuff's super interesting. Um, it allows us to sort of infer that it's correct. likely true for yep. dogs too, the stuff that they're seeing in and Dr. Hall brought that up. Chemistry is very similar. So he was like, "We can assume, but 
Yeah. The, sci- the scientist in us wants <laughs> to say, can we like prove it? They things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. That and makes that me was, very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's super interesting. You know, yeah. could there possibly, are we over-assuming that it's this, you know, who knows, mm-hmm. you know? Based on what you said, our antidotal evidence, we see a lot of the same thing. So therefore, our what evidence? Our, how do <laughs> make sure I say it? Uh, no, sorry. Did I, did I, did I say in the middle antidotal? Of your anecdotal. 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 Yeah, anecdotal. Yeah, there we go. Yes. I'm, 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 antidotal? I'm that's tormenting good. Cameron these days. Yeah. So, like, well, I he's open hanging the around ba- me way too yeah, much. Don't like, say things wrong no, no. around me because I pick it up and then I question myself. <laughs> so do I, Forrest. Yeah, that's what I started doing. Like, through the moon. That sounds perfectly normal. I've opened a bag of worms, clearly. The... Another interesting thing that comes up quite a bit now that we've been working together is definitions of condition reinforcers. The difference between um, where people get wrapped up a lot of times is what's terminal, what's keep going, what's stay there, what's is room service marker, is that is that terminal, is it not? I would like to have you just kind of discuss what you've seen just now in the past, you know, six months or so with the frequency of detection dog handlers that have come through here, um, where a lot of these conversations go into because they definitely go down some wormholes or rabbit holes or whatever we want to call mm-hmm. them. Um, but I'd love to hear your feedback and sure. maybe help clarify those that are watching and listening where the confusion comes in sometimes and how we can straighten that out. Right. I think I, I think for, as it applies to detection. All of the conditioned reinforcers are terminal. Um, I don't see people using a keep going marker much in detection. I mean, it's theoretically possible. Sure. You could have built it in where the dog's on on an indication and you say good and have them hold it for a longer period. Use that to bridge. Or not used. Well, a lot of times when they're saying good, the dogs are Stevie one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, it yeah, makes yeah. you feel a yeah. little bit off. And, and it's almost like the, what you get in an indication in detection is the the indication is an anticipation of reinforcement mm. and it's actually created frequently out of anticipation of reward so the dogs are locking up and freezing or sitting and staring or something like that in anticipation of reward and so if you use good or a continuation marker like we typically use in obedience like you're healing and i say good and you keep healing to add duration to that uh, kind of thing then it's it's almost like unless it was really, really well conditioned and people really took their time with it, it's going to distract the dog from the at anticipation. They might want to look at you. They might want to do something else, yeah. right? Well, Which like you, have some, pro- you have to proof against you, it. Actually. Yeah, you'd have to proof yeah. against it. And, it's, and, it, and I don't know that it's that valuable because that we don't care as much about like crazy amounts of duration mm-hmm. in, the, in the behavior like we do in some of the other obedience behaviors. So they're terminal in the sense that I don't expect you to st- not move a muscle, keep staring, keep your nose right in odor, any of that kind of thing. Uh, I'm giving you information about where the reward's going to be is really what it is. Like the same kind of thing we're doing in obedience. So one that says I'm bringing the reward to you and I'm going to pay you right there as close to the source as possible to keep you dedicated to that place so you don't start wanting to leave it to get to me. And the other is you're free to break off from that completely and come to me, right? And that feels like the more pertinent piece of the information. Mm -hmm. They're both terminal. The dog's not going to maintain a perfect indication. When I tell the dog I'm bringing the reward to you, they're going to go. Yeah. But they're going to stay close if I've done a good job of that. And I can bring it to them there. But they're both are, are, the dog's going to stop the behavior that I, that I'm reinforcing when I go to do it. Yeah. But it makes more dedication to source. If I bring it to you, Mm -hmm. you are here. You have to perform the correct indication for me to mark in the first place. And then I'm going to bring the reward there so you stay close, stay dedicated. And then when that's solid, you can throw in releases back to you and you mix it up and you find the balance point for that dog, right? And at least, at least in protection sports, which I watch mostly, I see good success with people that choose to have a couple of different terminal markers that you know, predict value in different places. And I think that the function of it is to divide the dog's mind. Like there's not one given you know, predictable, outlet for yeah. this predictable place you're going to go. There's two, so you have to, at, you know, at least two. I think that's enough, personally. The gambling mm-hmm. aspect. You could, you could add a third, which means you know, go bite that dude over there. Sure. And then mm-hmm. another one could mean grab the toy on the ground. And the other could mean I'm paying you, mm-hmm. and like that that might be as tricky as you want to get. Um, but 
it divides the dog's mind. So they have to stick around a little bit longer for information to know where they're going. And there's a discipline involved mm -hmm. in that. Like you, Elaborate on that because that's really interesting. When uh, I recognize the same thing, and I've heard you begin to talk about it, yeah. and well, it made me explore that more. The idea we, we when we just so that you guys know what we're talking about the the um, discrimination. Once I built both markers, I set the dog up. And there's a toy on the ground in front of them or whatever, and instead of telling them get it or whatever their remote reward is, I say yes, and which means they have to turn to me, right? Yeah. And it's terminal bridge discrimination, and it's not, uh, yeah, unique to us. I mean, people have been doing it. But mm -hmm. So it, what it does is it protects the dog against mistakes of anticipation because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they stop anticipating one thing. If, if they know it's going to be one thing, the, the dogs that can't hold themselves together, they'll make a lot of mistakes en route to that certainty. Yeah. And so the minute that you present that there could be two options, I see a lot of composure. Yeah. on behalf of the dog mm -hmm. because they have to wait in place to get more information and that's not a given so the direction is well you've seen it in your in your dog natalie yeah. like his dedication to his indication is really super and you've re you can release him away a lot and it's almost like it's stabilized that he's there like i found it mm -hmm. tell me and he's thinking, like, is it going to be here or is it going to be there? Yep. Right. And there's a, a f almost a, a form yeah. of impulse control yes. connected That's to right. it, right? Yep. Where the dog ha isn't just like, oh, I'm going to grab. And so I could see in detection that helping with aggressive alert stuff and all yeah. that kind of thing. The fact that yeah. I can then release you away from it. And then the dog has to think a little bit there. Just kind of balances them out. It's a, a, yeah. it's a thoughtfulness, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, um, that they're kind of like... <laughs> forced to take yeah, on right because right? and it's all contingent on um, i mean you've got work to do to get to that point they they're just as happy to pick up the thing on the ground as to take the thing you're going to give them or or if you're trying to divide the helper between yourselves mm -hmm. you know they're, they're you have play that's meaningful around helper and so that's your work beforehand but once you start to play those games i think it's it's really incredible and like you've always said it gives you another option mm -hmm. in training there's that's still folks one. i run into that say i wouldn't want to play with my dog around a helper and and then i <laughs> I don't know. You can do that. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. But I probably yeah. am not going to be as interested in your training as somebody that is striving for that because I think that why, why you, wouldn't you have that yeah, as an option? You, I mean, I think it's an old fashioned idea that yeah. that yeah. if my dog will take a toy uh -huh. in the presence of the decoy, then my dog isn't a yeah, real protection dog. We absolutely know thing. that's not the yeah, case. Yeah, absolutely. And don't I mean like a level of kind of dividing the dog like that is like almost teaching like a mental flexibility skill mm -hmm. to Hell be yeah. able to switch between and channel that towards you know what that what that marker is right here's here's an interesting sideage to it and it feels the same to me so a buddy of ours uh, tyler muto i was talking to him about it and he said you know when i'm working with certain reactivity cases like here's a dog that for whatever reason um when it sees little white dogs has a big problem with it He's like, it's easier for me to work that dog around five little white dogs oh, yeah. than one little mm -hmm. white dog. Yeah, that's Because it can't concept. fixate. Yeah, yeah it's 100%. It's, it's not oh, yeah. just one little target. There's multiple things. And, yeah. and he says that he can like, get his work done faster with greater ease in that situation. And it feels the same to me. That makes absolutely perfect sense. Uh, we've no, known it all the time. Like, it's been what's, a flooding situation. What, yeah, it's a, it, it, a little yeah. bit. Mm -hmm. Like, you have a dog, you're working distraction work in a busy environment yep. no problem yep. you're working distraction work in a quiet environment and one thing happens like it's biological the dog's like i gotta attend to that yep. <laughs> and yep. all their energy goes to that yep. yeah so but the discipline of multiple markers i lo i really like yep. and especially in the protection sports and that's something that michael had i got from him you know when i first met him 13 or four years ago or something was doing and and i had a, a dog that was really into fighting like the mm -hmm. helper, but I did a good damn job with the play, so I had that too, and it meant a lot to my ability to make the training that I enjoyed making. Yep. And so I think it's it's really useful. And I was having trouble, like when my when my training got too protection focused, like I was doing a little bit too much bite work, and I wasn't reminding him of play opportunities, and I wasn't um, using my my discrimination of markers. Um, like he would he would unravel a little bit so mm -hmm. i always kept that alive like the possibility of me rewarding you and these two different things and you have to be present to hear them and it really helped yeah. and it wasn't hard to maintain either in right. my experience yeah no once it, it's the, the initial buy ins the yeah. hard part right yeah. it, 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 also I'm, I'm, I don't know how this applies to detection off the top of my head, but like, <laughs> we're, like not, we're not talking but, about detection but, on this motor phase. The same, <laughs> well, when we're thinking about that, you said something a, a minute ago when we were talking about um, 
if if I'm going to make reward discrimination uh, in the beginning stages, I have to have roughly equal value in both of those things. I was going right? to bring up. So if I have a dog, yeah. the dead object is going to be much less motivating to a certain dog than coming and playing with me, for instance, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. I have to have it two things that are kind of equal in the beginning. This is something we struggle with in protection work where you have something the dog wants significantly more than this and whether or not you'd make play styles with both of them that were sort of equal you pick that up and i make the same kind of play with you or we do some of the loop type things that we, you and i have talked about a, a fair bit like the idea that you start out pre macking mm-hmm. that like you have to play with me to have access to this mm-hmm. and for a while it's you play with me then you get access to that, mm-hmm. right? You play with me, you get access to that. And all your sessions start that way. And then there's a point at which you play with me, you get access to that. Now in order to play with, to get access to this again, you have to come back and play with me a second time. Yeah. And it creates those sort of little loops, yeah. right? Where they in, enforce each other. And that's the point at which a dog will technically leave something or turn their energy away from something of more value or something of less value, because this is where people run into trouble. Like, what if I don't have anything? Maybe mm-hmm. I can think of all kinds of experiences. Yeah. Like, they're going to detection work. There's some dog that really likes searching, like, and you rewarding them is an annoyance. <laughs> like, <laughs> totally. right? yeah. Yeah. like, like yeah. let me get back to that. Yeah. So you break off because you did the right behavior. I make some value here, and then your reinforcement is to be able to go back and do that That's again right. or whatever it is. That's pretty you bad. create those little... Yeah, I was going to say, if you want to define, for those that may not know, what premacking is, just so they get yeah, a concept so of it. Premac principle, the David Premac, and it was basically the idea of a less valuable, less likely activity in front of a more valuable, more uh, likely activity makes the less valuable activity more valuable, right? A, so low, a low probability behavior, behavior can serve as reinforcement for a high probability behavior. behavior. Low probability, the thing you want the dog to do. <laughs> yeah. the high probability the behavior, the thing, thing they want to do. Exactly. Exactly. Please look at me. Dog's yeah. like, fuck you, I'm so going to chase squirrels. About, yeah. yes. We talk about it a, chase squirrels. a lot with, uh, with exercises. Like and as an obedience trainer, I could say, oh, my dog loves retrieving but doesn't isn't so hot on healing, right? And I have, so I, in training, I practice healing and I always follow it with retrieving, right? So that cool. gains value, right? Cool. Yeah. In that way. But also there, you can use functional rewards. This is what a lot of the reward-based trainers are trying to say. Oh, my dog has predatory activity. We're reward-based trainers, Yes, Michael. we are. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. Purely <laughs> reward-based yeah. trainers. Yeah. They use nothing yeah. else. Yeah. Right? <laughs> then, the, then you're trying to control when the environment potentially has something that's more valuable than to the dog than anything you can provide them, right? Mm -hmm. They try to set up training contingencies in which you have to do something for me in order to access the things in the environment, right? Instead of just saying, you can't do that, so this is what you've got to do, right? And there's some interesting thinking that goes into that. There's lots of cases in which that's just not feasible right yeah. you know you can't let the dog engage in certain kinds of activity yeah. <laughs> even if they find it very reinforcing yeah. but uh, it, regardless that's an it's a with and we started just talking about different markers and i think that kind of sums sums it up or why you would might use different terminal markers and have some discrimination well i was just saying sarah bruski in the episode prior to this um shared the sequence where she equated it to obedience just like you guys did mm-hmm. to detection and she's not really heavily into detection yet the example she gave was, okay, just like we talked about, I have a condition reinforcer that means I'm going to reward at you at source. I also have the one that means you released to me for the reward. So she said, whatever I would do, the dog, and she said, the key to this is the level of motivation for the reward creates that stronger anticipatory behavior and what might happen based on the reward location. So... The example she gave, dog goes to odor. Let's say you have a really active, wiggly dog. It's hard for them to kind of stay still. They do stuff. So dog goes to the source. She says good. So they don't. They understand they're correct, but if they're a little wiggly or do whatever, as she's approaching when they're the right position, and then gives, gives whatever condition reinforcer and pays there. The other version was the dog finds the thing, good, they hold that position, and then she can decide, do I go in or am I coming back? Question that typically comes up when we discuss this way of things, 
the typical side that I see in the professional world is why do I need two different ones? Why can't the dog just stay there? I can walk up and say free, pay them right there. Or I don't walk up, say free, and they know to come back. Now, what I loved was the examples we gave is that the reason why we don't do that is because the anticipation aspect, if it's just the one, and if where that one is typically at is what's causing the breakaway. So when those that say, oh, I don't like to use a condition reinforcer uh, or a word or marker, et cetera, because dogs leave odor. Well, if your dog's leaving odor, you've already, you've done that. The, we're not balanced right now. This, the dog's anticipating that's going to leave and they've been marked. Timing's been off, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a couple just, different reasons. That's just a lack of kind of understanding Correct. about how, yeah. how condition reinforcers work, right? We use them in all, all behaviors that we teach and, and obedience and the dog leaves the behavior to access the reward. All the right. Time. All of them. Like if I'm Be- going to obedience dogs work for the release. Yeah. For the yeah. release into the reward. And they still know they're what got them there was the work and the work is showing me where odor is. It's just a function. And the, and the practicality of it is if I always release away, my dog will be less dedicated to staying at source. Right. If I always reward at source. There are many practical places which you can't do that, right? Yeah. You talk about real world Correct. applications. Yep. I'm not going to bounce a toy off the bomb, right? Nope. It's not happening, right? <laughs> <laughs> so like, now if I don't have a way of releasing you, right? yeah. <laughs> right? good call. Yeah. Or these yeah. days the fentanyl. <laughs> right. yeah. Or fentanyl. Yeah, yeah, we don't like. And so uh, in training, I want it set up so that I can reinforce there so I keep the dedication, but I've also built in the idea you might be released away. I don't want the only time you're released away being in the field, right? just so it's balanced out and then you can maintain the behavior and do what's right for the dog in that cir- circumstance. Right. Yep. And if you don't have those options, right. And I think it's options. like, like Forrest said, you know, you could do it and maintain the behavior with all indirect reward, but the dog's going to be more likely to make more mistakes. And now yeah. you're S- some having, dogs. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. But then like you'd said that it can create, you know, greater commitment mm-hmm. to being in position on a target on your bed with, with, Pet dogs especially, like primarily we're rewarding them in place and then we're freeing yeah. them up in a very unexciting way. It's a neutral release, we call it. Mm-hmm. So it's not, yes, and you're chasing things around and tossing a ball. You could do that, but a lot of folks just need their dogs to calm down and chill, yeah. like the average person. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's the room service reward a yeah. lot. The problem I see, like when I was down at Lackland working with those military folks is, um, and this is where the breakdown happens, uh, like the dog does something and down, they say, good and they want to come up with the toy, and the dogs can't keep it together. Because reinforcement's already happening, mm-hmm. right? It's already happening. Yeah. Like, at that point, you have to almost just forget about what's going on because no longer does it, like, really matter to the thing that happened before you said good and started yep. walking. You're walking in, reinforcement is already happening. Yep. And so the work that has to be done there is teaching the dog to control its impulses in the face or the presence of rewards. And, like, the agility folks are, are lights out good at this type of stuff, like... Um, you know, I, and I see this now, it's just a, another, uh, like, variation of, uh, like, maybe Susan Garrett's at your choice or whatever, but, like, the Zen hand or mm-hmm. people that are holding closed fists. I do that a lot, like, mm-hmm. and just because I use different hand signals to communicate different things. But, you know, like, the food is here. Chill out. Yeah. And it'll come to you. And if you do, we talk, Michael and I talk about, like, how much of that work is good early on for sport prospects prospects because do you do you idle them too much or slow them down mm-hmm. too much but i know like one question. of the first things i do with antsy puppies is i'll have my bait bag sitting in front of me and they might be jumping all over me and i'll just wait until they like step off of me yes food just to get them like to stop you know mugging me he had a border collie puppy that he took on for some weird reason <laughs> yeah. 10 years ago <laughs> and all he was trying to get that dog to do was assault him <laughs> like, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. so i was over there in the chair getting this board this malamon to quit jumping on me and he's over there getting a border collie to try to fucking <laughs> climb in his hair that's yeah. what we do that a lot with the spaniels <laughs> yeah so di- like different strokes but like the the military guys um what we did is we just we got him closer to the dogs and just got the dogs to like take a breath with the ball in front of them because mm-hmm. like calm down a little bit yeah. and and then we were able to do things like now they've done something say good and they just learn to keep it together more and Mm -hmm. chill out a bit but anyway would we want to teach that or could we teach that using the reward item that's less stimulating to the dog to get the mechanics or the 
calmness oh, to sure. oh i have yeah. it with, i have it with food before i even Wait, expect yeah. you don't even think about it yeah. with the toy until which is you know dts they don't they don't use food yet. <laughs> i know <laughs> and, and, and so an good luck yeah. no and that's yeah. a common one that we run into that's why i asked the question was the change that we have made uh, over the past couple of years was using food in our early sequences of detection mm. the last repetition being reward with a toy yeah. in most cases um and how much benefits you get from that. Because then when you go to toy only, there's a total different mindset and clarity in the dog because we weren't trying to teach that in that extremely high aroused state. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things I think that, that the industry and detection on the professional life falls into is the use of the highest value reward so much and early on. And it causes those dogs to operate in this much more elevated threshold area. Yeah. The lacks of clarity. You can't get the reps in. The mental flexibility is reduced dramatically because of that stimulation. And just doing the same things, but incorporating, in this case, like we talked about food, to get this understood and get repetitions and get some clarity to it, it's just avoided because of the reward item. The, the, the trainer or the program saying, Ooh, I don't want to do I think, that. I think it's important too to rec back to the thing we were talking about at the beginning. Do that away from the detection. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When Forrest is talking about that, he's not trying to teach the yep. dog that while you're teaching behavior. So it would be something you would do in your your reward development phase. Yep. While I'm doing stuff with food with you, I'm going to start to show you yep. different way. Like you got to be patient if you go for this. And I said, I'm bringing it to you. I'm not giving it to you. Yeah. And I bring it back to you. And then you do the same thing with your toy. Like teach your dog how to play and yeah. then bring those things. And then take them there and it's smooth yeah. sailing. Yeah. Before There's you teach them anything, you uh, you iron out your yeah. reward systems, basically. Yeah. Your enforcement systems. And once that you have the all the details there, then you can train some stuff. And I'll, I tell you good and I'm coming in, for example, to pay you. I've already worked it out that you're going to keep it together and you're cool-headed about yeah. that. Yeah. That's the whole step zero that we teach frequently in oh, Odor cool. Pays is because... It's just we, the foundation stuff. Yeah, yeah so. we want all that stuff taught before we get to Odor. That's why I call it zero Yeah. because there's no Odor involved yeah. in it. Um, and steps for easy people to remember. So we frequently, when Michael and I and Natalie are teaching, we go into that how much investment you need to put in step zero. Yeah. Because that really lays that groundwork by the time I get to odor, where now we're in an important phase of learning. This part needs to be good. Yep. We did the heavy lifting and built the foundation in zero. Yep. So now when we get to odor, this is much easier than what a lot of methodologies right now kind of smash those two things together. They try to do all this teaching oh, yeah. while they're at odor. And depending on the dog, whatever the condition is, or thing they picked up on happens and there's just confusion yeah. by just simply separating and building some of those steps in that zero phase. Yep. We go to, we go to step one, we're at odor, man, life is so I mean, much easier. Good dog trainers do that everywhere, right? Correct. Not, yeah. Like, you know, look at the top agility trainers. They're not introducing equipment until they've got a whole bunch. They've got yeah. the reward systems, That's their communication it. system ironed out. They've taught the dog the behaviors that are going to be a part of yeah. And what, Contacts what, and everything. Yeah. What you guys are doing in here is uh, is really smart. Like you're walking these folk, you're giving them, uh, like, they're becoming accountable and they're detailed in their handling. They know what they're meant to be doing. There's this accountability on them. It all happens away from the dog. And then if something like breaks down, they know they've spent time learning that, paying attention to it. They're very aware of it. Like yeah. they catch themselves making mistakes. You can find the breakdown easier. Yeah. 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 And I find that when, when folks are, um, like when they're interested in doing things like teaching their dog impulse control with with food or, or playing some of these games, they just know they spent time training something and now it's in their mind. And so if it goes awry, I'm working on a down now and I start walking into you and you started to become uneasy about it. It's like, I'm very aware that that's happening because I've worked really hard on that. And you'll have some sort of answer to that that helps the dog either like recompose themselves or whatever. And that's important. And you'll never forget those things. Yeah. And those things anchor good training moving forward. I take it for granted because like very quickly in dog training, I caught on to him, right? Uh -huh. And Michael's thing for 20 years has always been um, like, so and we talk about Malinois a lot and, and I got a Malinois from him, but they're eventually going to like toy more mm -hmm. taught everything with food because it was easier to do. It was 
lower drive or they like it when they're puppies mm -hmm. and so it's easy to work with and you develop your toy game separately and then when your toy game is like super flex and then all your food work is ironed out you add toy and like bam you've got a line yeah <laughs> but it's just what we're talking about it's like you taught these things in lower arousal we were mm -hmm. very detailed we cared about that stuff we made nice training and then we just charge that stuff with the toy and then it was <laughs> like bam look at me now. Yeah, yeah right <laughs> then you did both. yeah, yeah. And so, so we're having these conversations 15 years later and i'm so, like here you go. well i'm it's finding the same thing as we're bouncing around like now i'm spending time out looking at a lot of different disciplines that i've been aware of but haven't spent a lot of time taking a deep dive and i'm that's I'm like, no, nah, I want to I wanna know more about that. Like yeah. Yeah. Uh, our discussion the other day. So it's like, how the hell does sheep herding work? Like just to get deep into all of this stuff. But every time I look at it, no matter what the discipline, when people are having problems, it goes back to those basic yeah. things. There was a breakdown in, the, in their early relationship communication motivation yep. systems. Yep. And if those things are good, then you always have a place to go back and work on something. Yeah. But when they're not... Like that's the root of all kinds yeah. of problems, yep. and people are trying to troubleshoot in the context yes. of the the finished product at some point yeah. all the time. And that's when it feels dirty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's when it feels dirty. Yeah, I don't yeah. Even know how to move forward? It, that's where the deeper like, struggles are at, yeah. and and it's hard to pinpoint what the problem was when we're trying to fix it in the field. Yeah. Well, in a seminar thing, that's a bad. That's a bad. Oh yeah, a bad vibe, mm. right? They want mm. you to come in and they want to troubleshoot, mm -hmm. and you're yeah. like. Okay, we got to go back to step zero. Right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Like, you yeah. need to take it out, and you got to do this stuff, and and people are reluctant in a lot of those yeah. cases. But that's where the fix is. And it's unfair you. to the dog, like to try to do it that far along. Like for us in detection, you have an issue with your indication. The dog just did like a beautiful, you know, five ten minute search, and then they get to indication, and it's terrible. And then mm -hmm. you don't want to reward. It's like, well, what about all that other stuff? That's right. That yeah. You're like throwing Amen. that away. Yeah. Amen. I was going to ask you guys, since this is the, uh, you, Michael, has seen a little bit of the cognition. Um, I would just love, either, like we talked about off camera, was um, cognition gets la uh, wrapped up as, because I've been doing it as a detection thing. And it's oh, yeah. clearly not. Um, but I would just love for people to hear what you guys have seen now that you both have kind of seen a, a, enough of it. Um, what's your thoughts, opinions, and what would you share to those that were like, what's this cognition stuff about? Like, should I even care? Yeah, I think everybody should do it with their mm -hmm. dog. It's fun. Um, yeah, you mentioned that that yesterday that people maybe ignored a little bit because they tie you up as just a nose work, work guy. And you, uh, I love listening to you talk and do your thing. You're like in, com in command of it in the right way. You're such an experienced guy. You're smart as a whip. Uh, so aside from that, right, like you're legit <laughs> in the nose work stuff. You're making you me are, blush. But you're, a, but you're a dog man through and through. But it was very clear for me from the beginning. It's got everything and nothing to do with nose work. It's just dog uh -huh. stuff. And what, what I like is um, these methodical setups and uh, like the rawness of it, like get the hell out of, your, out of the way and let the dog be the dog mm -hmm. and then learn something about him. That's fun. Like we all, yeah. that's why we like herding and we like the nose work because like you just try to get out of your dog's way and let them be. And so it reveals some things. And uh, so to me, that's been the neat portion of it. So I would say that everybody should be uh, interested in it. And, you know, like you guys are putting out resources to or connecting folks to stuff that they can do online, that they could even do it from their home. Mm -hmm. But it'll tell you something. It'll reveal something that you wouldn't know. And that's cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited about the where this is going to be 10 years from now, right? Absolutely. As we begin to kind of understand how to apply it and incorporate it into training programs, right? Like the idea, uh, of course, once you can get everybody over the idea that it's a test and your dog's smart or stupid or some yeah. bullshit like that. The labels like, they come up with. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, we're, we're looking at the dog and how they learn and how they process information. And this is telling you something about that dog's brain and how it works, right? And I think there's a lot of potential as we get more data and more dogs going through this and more people using it as part of training programs for both selection yes. and setting training plans. So that feels like it has a lot of potential and we're kind of just at the beginnings of it mm -hmm. where this is curious and interesting right now, but what's it going to tell us is going to be valuable. And my hunch is that it's going to tell us a lot of stuff that's going to be valuable. Sure. Places where you're, we have our patterns, our way of working things and we do it with every dog when you could be given some information that would say, you know, get yourself out of the picture sooner for this dog. This dog's going to be much more influenced by their handler, you know, and independent thinking. This dog uses memory a lot, so if I'm 
doing generalization stuff, I need to be extra careful about changing the picture frequently. There's lots of stuff there that I think is going to pl play out to be valuable for yeah. and for selecting dogs for different disciplines, right? Sure. Heck yeah. But I, I love it. I love having a Mondio crowd this time oh, yeah, because yeah. there's so much fun I can have with sharing, like, see, this grid worked really well with Mondio dogs because of, you know, because of how dynamic the environment and decision making has to happen in Mondio. The conditions is at the judges or your guys' program's discretion at that day of that trial. So a dog with high inference is really valuable in that aspect. They can make a decision quickly. Uh, whereas a dog with stronger memory would be like, I'm looking for the pattern here and that mm -hmm. pattern didn't happen. So, mm -hmm. but if that Mondio handler trainer knew that, that dog was stronger in memory, look at the training plan that would be established yeah. that would save, makes training efficient. Right. Now, you, though that we still learned those things, we still problem solved and most trainers figure it out. But if you know that from the start, you're saving and you're putting the dog through a lot less confusion because we're able to approach it from a way it understands. Yeah, and I think, and you're, and you're taking away some of the people's disappointment in their dog, right? Yeah. Yep. You know, there's yeah. this idea that like this dog's stupid because it's not picking up what I normally do, yeah. right? And you see that all the time in dog training where somebody's getting down on their dog for something. And anything that helps somebody kind of understand, like, this Her dog, dog isn't is stupid. It's coming. Yeah. It's an individual. It's coming at this different way. Like it, you just have to find That's a way powerful. to communicate. That's super powerful yeah. to me, right? Yeah. And yeah. like, it's, like it's so their brains are capable of stuff that are beyond us, right? Yeah. In a, oh, in a yeah. way, and there we certainly know their olfaction is way beyond uh, ours. And, and so the uh, that something that helps you kind of get a, a window into that world is cool. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. it's a lot of fun. I'll I'll. Uh, end this podcast on this word and I'll let Forrest explain it. Asymptote. <laughs> <laughs> well, asymptote? Yeah. Asymptote. Asymptote. <laughs> See, asymptote. don't ask me to say words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't really think I have any idea what asymptote <laughs> means, but the story, I guess, behind it is we had a, at that Arkansas thing, Cameron and I sat down with Pat and Bob and a few other people. Angel was there. Yeah. Um, but, and this is in Bob's book, I think, but, you know, the, I, I, the, the bottom line is, or like the just of it is that there's a certain amount of reps it takes for, let's say, a dog to understand a concept and then just working more of it without shifting something forward criteria does do no benefit to the retention of uh, or the learning. And so it, it's, I think it's a, it's a tip of the hat to like shift your criteria at a certain point. Like Bob Bailey had an 80-20 mm -hmm. rule, right, if it's 80% proficient. Mm. And uh, that's probably totally wrong and not what it is. Yeah, at all. right. <laughs> but it has something to do with like the dog's retention of something. And then at a certain point, they've got it. And it doesn't matter how much more you do, this much time can go on right. and they'll still have it at this point. Right. Yeah. right? It's so a long term, do short term more. memory thing for yeah. us, too, mm. right? You know, what, wh how many exposures to something do you have to have before it goes into the long term memory and you don't have to be reminded of it anymore? I feel right? like you should ask him. I feel like that's it. I feel like that's it. Yeah. But that, that's fascinating because yeah. it, 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 that feels right, too. And the asymptote is the point, right? Yeah. It's like a measurable point where it plateaus, and Pat Nolan had explained it yes, to us quite correct. eloquently, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even though and his, then we, his drawing we, sucked in my notebook. <laughs> right? Yeah. Stick to dog training. But then yeah. we, how, much, how much wasted time do we potentially have? Exactly. Because we're doing the same thing over and exactly. over again, thinking we're, these are maintenance reps, yep. but they're, they're unnecessary maintenance reps. Exactly. Yeah, that's super interesting. You should interesting. invest your training yeah, time. Yeah, well, it's interesting to you guys because he was relating it, Pat was directly to like dogs learning odor, conditioning to odor. Like and at a so certain like point, at you're certain done. point, they're conditioned and don't do it anymore because it's not benefiting you. And so move on. And actually, you don't even have to revisit it for three months because it's locked in. Mm -hmm. Back to that cognitive yeah. part I shared today was why people keep doing so many repetitions on an odor because the mentality was, well, I want them, I don't want them to forget it. Mm -hmm. I want to know more about that now, though, because I just think of that like there's so many different, you know, like odor mixtures that you might want to show well, the dog, like. Feel like it's so, like, but I think then you're changing some criteria. So right? then, yeah. it, so the then it, so it, then it's like, is it that would just be your kit? Like after you've done enough repetition on your kit, you need to get a new kit because like that yeah. one's done. Correct. Yeah. That, that's that's, that's a part exactly of right. that. What get he just said. In. Yeah, get padded. The the minute you hit that curve where it's solid, 
you need to create another And then variation. is there like a certain point that now you've generalized it enough that like now it's like. This is now where it gets into the individual dog. Hope, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Some dogs that may happen at this stage, another dog at a different stage. This is that, this is back to that cognition part. What does this dog there's so many variables for odor, yeah. even like how inaccessible right. it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's why when people make that as soon as a dog has stimulus what was oh that? yeah <laughs> like share that yeah one we quick. get people that are like and i actually thought this too and i always share this with my students because it sounds so stupid now but like when i was training for my first nw3 that's where in nose work you're introduced to blank areas and i always thought like uh, at that point in my training, I didn't know hardly anything. And why would I train but you blank areas? you could feel areas? it, girl. You had a good <laughs> feel. <laughs> like, I don't need to train blank areas because my dog will only respond to odor, right? So, like, I could just do a blank room. There's nothing for my dog to respond to. There's no stimulus. So my dog won't go into indication. Mm-hmm. And anybody that does detection or nose work, <laughs> and you know, you that is not a thing. How'd that work <laughs> out for you? <laughs> and there's a, lot, there's a lot to that, just the dog's <laughs> expectation when you don't introduce that and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But... There's this idea that we hear of people like, well, then you don't have stimulus control. We're like, well, when it comes to odor, what is stimulus? Like, at what right. point? Because your stimulus is constantly changing. Yeah. So it makes it really challenging. Place, oh, yeah. So, much, so, so I mean, I think there is a point that you do with a with an experienced dog. You do hit what we could consider stimulus control over the indication behavior. But at what point is that and what degree of generalization and all of that stuff does the dog need to see before you could say that? And it, it is, it'll be different for every dog, but just, just to say, well, once you put the dog on odor, you should have stimulus control. Like, well, and, and, and it goes into, then people want numbers. How many reps do I do to do that? How long do I do to do that? What's the time frame? We're always looking for these concrete answers and it's not black or white. Yeah. The yeah. dogs are so, you know, amazing but variable. Yeah. Get the four of us to try to learn something the same way. Yeah. It's going to be different. And that's the part I see in detection and in the cognitive aspect and dog training in general. We're finally coming around to realize, and this is the lovely answer now that it has become popular, train the dog in front of you. But I think there's still some understanding that needs to be developed where how do I do that? And, and knowing that that benchmark or the goal, the goal line is different. For this dog, it's here. This dog, it's here. This dog, I have to put this much more or I have to communicate this way. Because we get, we, we become tribal in a method or tribal about a tool or so on and so forth. And then that starts putting handcuffs on us and that learning progression because we feel we have to do it by this thing yeah. or for that thing. And Dude, dog training is, at least to me, is such a qualitative Amen. experience yep. and thing. Like, Amen. like Bart Bellin said long ago, like you, something you got to taste and smell and feel. And it's hard to quantify mm-hmm. qualitative mm-hmm. experiences. Yeah. And so yep. it's great, the numbers and the protocols yeah. and things like that. But um, it, I just... I love dog training with heart. Yeah. yeah. And you can't measure that yeah. shit. Nope. Amen. <laughs> yeah. And it's and it's and those those protocols and those those techniques and stuff are not useful without relationship. Like yeah. you, the the part of it is the your ability to observe a dog and know them so that you can tell when they're when, in yeah. and out yeah. and yeah. really see them and the the relationships that's there. And at that point, if I have that if I can really see you mm. and I know what you feel like at these different levels and you trust me and we have this relationship, then the techniques become valuable. Mm. But if you're applying the techniques without that, then there's no connection between you and the dog and they, they, they it won't work. Yeah. Like it's not, and it, people want dog training as a recipe like that. Give me the technique and understanding the techniques, they're useful, but only when it's layered over that mm-hmm. yeah. when it's layered over cool. that relationship. Right. Yeah. But it, that's great information i think that's like a perfect spot for people to kind of take this episode and move forward and and think about these things like that and truly value that relationship we have with our dogs and truly value the ability to communicate in the way that that works for my dog yeah and if i'm a trainer understand and appreciate and to me love the fact that i get challenged by the other dog that 
allows me to do it a different way mm-hmm. versus rubber stamping assembly line style repetitive way of doing it. You know, I would love to have, whether it be my nose work club or my police canine unit that I can truly adapt to each team, whether it be human and dog together to maximize my, my results. Sure. It, you know, I embrace the, to me, I want to be embraced. I want to embrace the challenge. I want to go through that struggle and go, Ooh, this one's all right. Yeah. How do I get into this one? How do I crack that nut? Yeah. You, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's to me the fun, you know? So I hope everybody listening, um, enjoyed this episode Forrest, Michael, yeah, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Really yeah. Thank you fun. guys. Thanks. Yeah. It's fun just to do these kind of impromptu, just let it rip and see what happens kind of episode like we did here. But thank you for your knowledge. Thank you for both for all that you share with everybody else. Um, Thank you for bringing in a in a time where dog training has become more polarized than ever, bringing us back to center with a more accepting mentality, you know, versus the othering aspects. Um, Be willing to hear what different points of view are. And I think that gets lost sometimes. So I thank you guys for doing that and sharing these kind of moments with us. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Keep seeking, everybody out there. Keep seeking. There you go. (laughs) And like I always say on Canine's Talking Sense, just remember, it's okay to be nosy. (laughs) (laughs) Touche.